Fantastic job, Lynn. I wish I could just stand up and sing a song like that. I can. You just don't want to hear it. That's the truth. All right. Take your Bibles, if you would, and start turning to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, in the latter half of the chapter, we'll start with that in just a moment. We've, we've got two different texts for today, and um, the message title is obviously the cross project, but underneath the cross project is meeting needs. And so today we're talking about meeting needs in other people's lives. And um, you, you, did you know, you, you probably know this, that those who are, are not a part of the church, the lost, those, those who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, those people that are that are far, you know, outside of, of the of the grace of God, and we're trying to draw them in. Did you know that that they truly believe that the purpose of the church is to meet needs? That is an expectation from folks who look from the outside in, who place those things upon the church. And they would gauge our authenticity and whether or not we are truly Christians based upon whether or not they can see that we are meeting needs. That's their gauging. And I want to say today right up front that they got it right because Jesus lays the same expectations upon us in Matthew chapter 25. We'll start reading here in, in verse 31 in a moment, but I've just got to get this premise down. I'm going to read to you two verses out of this passage. Verse 40 says, to the extent that you did it to the to the, one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. So Jesus, you'll see in this passage, is saying about good deeds and helping strangers and lost and hungry and, and whatnot, to the extent that you did it to one of them, you did it unto me, Jesus speaking. So you can be a blessing to Jesus directly just simply by being a blessing to others. And then in the same teaching, he repeats the same concept except in a different way. In verse 45, he says, To the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it unto me. Before we read, let me just bring in the whole context of this teaching, all right, so this is a snapshot, just a, a portion of this sermon or of this personal teaching that Jesus is giving to his disciples, and um, chapter 24, verse 4 says, and Jesus answered and said to them, um, see to it that no one misleads you, and, and he's just answering questions uh, that the disciples brought up in their life, they're on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately saying these things. So it spurred a teaching moment. They're, they're on the hillside. They're kind of by themselves. And as Jesus starts to answer their questions, the teaching before today's text is about the talents, your time, treasure, and talents. And he makes it very clear that our expectation, his expectation upon us is to be faithful with our time, our treasure, and our talents. And so that's the context, and so he's bringing it in, keeping in mind that this is one of the last teachings that he will give his disciples before he's crucified and buried, and so this is a real, real important time. Let's go to our text now in Matthew chapter 25 and read together starting in verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Okay, he's making it a very clear point here. There are lost people, and there are saved people. Saved people are the sheep, and the lost people are the goats, and at the appointed time, he will come and separate the two. Verse 33. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king, this is King Jesus. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked. And you clothed me. I was sick, 
and you visited me. And I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous man answered him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked, or even clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, or come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it unto me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which was that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. And I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then... They themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Verse 45. Then he will answer them, truly I say unto you, to the extent that you did not do it unto one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. And so Jesus is brought, bringing the disciples' attention and now our attention to a very important concept, and that is of meeting needs. And he makes it an issue. It's either you're authentic and you are part of the ones who are meeting needs, or you are inauthentic and you are not meeting needs. We all have that concern for lostness inside of us. If you're saved, it's a burden. Now we need to kindle that burden into a bright and flaming bonfire. Don't just let it flicker, but stoke that burden and become one who is interested in meeting needs. We've got a plague in our country that we would kind of defer to the government to do all of these things through governmental programs. Guys, we are the church and God has given us this responsibility. We're the church. We don't want to pawn people off on, on this process. One of the worst experiences that I've ever had is going to the DMV. You don't want to direct someone to a governmental process. It's a horrible experience. And your name will be on that experience. I would say utilize that opportunity to meet a need in Jesus' name to the best of your ability. And so Jesus is clear. Either we did or we did not. Two categories. You did or you did not. So if you ignore the needs of others, in all reality, you are truthfully, this is Jesus bringing this concept to us, you're ignoring him. You're ignoring Jesus. When you have a need right in front of you, you're ignoring him. This text lets us know all together that we have this as a decision point in our life, either to make it a habit of starting to meet needs in people's lives or to not. Now, the teaching right before this, obviously Jesus was leading up to this convicting point. And he spent time teaching on time, talent, and treasure. And for those of us who would save up and store up and gather and invest and, and get what we can and can what we get... You will not be rewarded for that at all. You can go to heaven with a million or a billion, and you won't be rewarded at all for that. But for the person who takes even just a dollar and meets a need in Jesus' name, they will be rewarded for eternity. This is Jesus' economics lesson. This is his economy. This is how we operate. We're in the world, but not of the world. We understand things from a biblical perspective, and, and we've got to guard how uh, we, we, we let other ideologies creep into our life. And so, here it is. If you would take what you do have and be faithful with it, the ending result is complete joy. In this teaching on the talents, Jesus said that the one who received five talents utilized it wisely and gained five more by God's help, okay? And in the end, he was rewarded. Jesus said, well done, my good and faithful servant, and enter into my joy, okay? Others have received 
other than five talents, but maybe two talents. To the one who received two talents, he gained two more. God helped him do that through his faithfulness. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. And now joy is the result for that individual. But for the one who was given one, he buried it. He didn't utilize it. He didn't use any of his time, treasure, or talents for God's glory. And he was called that wicked and evil one. And his ending result would be eternal regret. Eternally regretful for not even using one talent. You see, the premise here is even for that one who was given one talent, if he would have, by faith, started out to be faithful with that one talent, God would have helped him be effective with that, and it would have been two. And he would have also received that blessing from the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Some of you might say, well, I'm just a one talent or a .5 talented person. It don't matter. It don't matter a bit. You could be sitting right beside of a 10-talent person, and they will receive the same reward in the end. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It doesn't matter. God gives the increase. God is in control of the results. We are in control of faithfulness or unfaithfulness. And so that's the setting for Jesus saying, whatever you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me, and whatever you did not do unto the least of these, you've also done it unto me. And so authentic believers help meet the needs of the hungry, thirsty, strangers, naked, sick, and those who are imprisoned. Does that sound like lost folks, those who are maybe imprisoned in, in their lostness and don't have any hope? Does that sound like a lost person who is a stranger and who is, who is naked, one who doesn't have any um, righteous deeds, which is equal to clothing in the end in Revelation? Does that sound like that? I think that this is a, a teaching that has far-reaching ramifications and applications. Jesus wants us interested in thinking about and interacting with those who do not have the hope of glory. And so the ending result for these two categories is either eternal punishment or eternal life. And these are the most important teachings as we're wrapping, as Jesus is wrapping his life up here on earth before he's crucified and resurrected. He's given the disciples everything that he really expects. You know, if you fast forward just maybe 30 some odd years here in the text, there's a man who really comprehends this concept. His name is the Apostle Paul. And he pours into men. And he, he starts and ignites ministries and new churches. And he, he, he just uses all of his time to, 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 to do missionary work. He uses all of his treasure. He was self-employed and made tents and utilized that to pay for himself and, and others. He used all, everything he could get his hands on for God's kingdom purposes. And you know what? He didn't regret a single dollar being invested into the kingdom. And neither would we. He would not regret an ounce of the energy that he poured out into furthering the, the kingdom process. And neither would we. Sometimes we're fooled by the evil one in thinking, oh, I want to conserve my energy. But that's a lie. When we pour ourselves out for kingdom purposes, then are we re-energized. When we give, God gives back to us, shaken down, filled up, and pouring over. When, when we truly operate in God's economy, you end up on top. But if you try and keep it, you'll lose it. But if you give it, you'll receive it. That is God's economy. It's exactly opposite of a lost individual. Lost individual wants to get all he can. No matter what the means are, we're not like that. We get what we can with biblical means. We don't sacrifice our beliefs or our morals, anything biblical to get more. It's a real temptation to give in to the processes of this world and just say, hey, I'm, you know, if... If I just kind of sacrifice a little bit on this end, maybe cheat a little here on my taxes or maybe, you know, scrape on the corner on this or, you know, maybe do this, you know, uh, kick back as a favor, I'll gain more. Sometimes, folks, we get it's so tempting to cave to the world's economy to try 
and get ahead. But God's in control of the results. And if you abandon your morals and your biblical beliefs, the ending result will just drop out like a purse with a hole in it. You can throw as much money as you want into a purse that has a hole in it and it'll just keep on leaking out. God's in control of helping things move forward in your life or moving back. It's up to us to be faithful. Let's just take a look by way of example in the book of Titus and see just how well the Apostle Paul comprehends this concept. Now, I told you that Paul was a missionary and he was all over the place and he had far-reaching ministries. And now, this is about the farthest point as to which you can get away from Rome. And if, you, if you're looking at a map upright, Rome, kind of like where Italy is now, that little boot-looking country. If you circle around all the way around through Galatia, come all the way down the Mediterranean through these high mountains and work your way through Judea down to Bethlehem and Jerusalem, <coughs> keep heading towards, you know, the sea and then get on a boat and sail <coughs> to this island of Crete. Terry, if you get me some water, please, I'd appreciate it. I might be able to make it through. If you get down to this island of Crete, this is about the farthest away from Rome's headquarters as you can get. And now, here he is, Paul teaching Titus what to do in order to reach these churches. Let me read this to you. This island of Crete has about 100 cities. And the island was 160 miles long, and there were a lot of young churches in this area. They were within the Roman Empire, but just outside of the imminent threat of persecution for being a Christian. Which, by the way, that persecution for being a Christian was being strung up and burned on a cross or stretched in between two horses or something the like. But these churches were popping up everywhere on this island of Crete, and they needed leadership. Paganism was invading the church culture, and false prophets from uh, an, an ideology of Judaism was trying to get in for false prophecies and gain money. This was a problem. There was confusion over doctrines. So Paul recognizes the need for strong leadership, and he says a few pointed things to Titus. So turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 1, and we'll read verse 4. Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I have directed. Now, through this short book called Titus, to Titus, which, whom is Paul's disciple, if you read through this short book of three chapters, you'll see five or six times a concept that is repeated more than any other concept. Titus is a rich book. It's like a church planning manual, to be honest with you. It's phenomenal. It, it has all the, the essentials right in here. And for these new ministries, for the sustainment of a good church, Guess which concept is repeated over and over and over? That's it. The title for today's message, Meeting Needs, Doing Good Deeds. So, point number one is taken from Titus chapter 2, verse 7, and that is the instruction for meeting needs. Chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. With purity and doctrine dignified, and so forth and so forth. So here we see the instruction. Paul instructs Titus to train elders or pastors in all of these churches to teach the people that they should be about doing good deeds. That is point number one, the instruction for meeting needs. Point number two, the motivation for doing good deeds. That is found in verse 14 of chapter 2. Verse 14 chapter 2, who gave himself, who gave himself for us? Jesus. This is him implied here. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. 
So it's not a haphazard thing for us to be doing good deeds. It is a very intentional thing since we've been instructed to do good deeds. And then we're just to, to go ahead and decide to be happy about it and to be zealous about doing good deeds. So it's a matter of shaping your mind towards this concept. Unfortunately, I don't think that the majority of us are really happy about meeting needs and sharing Christ. I think it's time to get on Jesus' bandwagon here and to reshape who we are in Christ. It's not just about attending and giving. It's not just about reading. It's about doing, Jesus said as well. It's time for us to set aside time to meet needs and to share Christ, and to be motivated in this area. So point number two is the motivation for doing good deeds. Point number three is found in chapter 3, verse 1, and that is the readiness for doing good deeds. Chapter 3, verse 1 says to remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, and to be obedient and to be ready for every good deed. Ready. Ready to do a good deed. Always ready. Never wanting to put it aside, but always ready. God put you in the place to meet a need at that point in time, not somebody else. So it's up to us to be ready to do that, not only for regular people, but also for powerful people. Jesus mentioned here uh, back in Matthew chapter 25 about the strangers and the lost and the naked and the destitute and the sick. But look at this verse, remind them to be subject to the rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. See, Folks who have money, they also have needs. And people without money can meet the needs of people who have money. Because the people who have money, the needs that they have, can't be met with money. You get it? Everybody has needs. Nobody's perfect. But there's just something really cool about meeting a need that opens an individual's heart and soul. It does. You meet a need in their life, it opens it up, and all of a sudden they, they take a second look at who you are, and they're interested in why you would do that, and that's your opportunity to share Christ. You see, that's how it works. Be ready. Point number four is the benefiting from doing good deeds. You will benefit from doing these good deeds. Chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8, this is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. There it is again. These things are good and profitable for men. See, it's profitable for you to give because in the end, God blesses you more. It's profitable for you to be a blessing to somebody because in that you will receive blessings from the Lord. You've heard it before. You cannot outgive God. You will not miss that dollar nor that hour if you are a blessing to somebody. You will benefit from that immensely. I know people who, who feel like they have the gift of giving and they just want to give and give and give and give and give because they cannot outgive God. It's an amazing circle to where they just give and, and God gives them more to give. Whether it's time, whether it's treasure, or whether it's talent, it doesn't matter. Give, 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 give. You cannot outgive the Lord. You will be blessed because of that. And point number five, the expectation for doing good deeds is found nearly at the end of Titus in verse 14. And our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, meeting pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. So this is the expectation for doing good deeds. And again, it's laid out there. You're either going to be fruitful or unfruitful. You're either going to do or not do these things. You'll either receive a personal blessing from the Lord or you will forego your personal blessing from the Lord. You can't outgive God. And when God prompts it in our heart to do something like that, when you have the idea come into your mind to be a blessing, remember that idea is not from you. We are not good. God is good. That idea to do something good came from God. God gave you that idea. And if God wants you to do something good, he will help you do the good and be a blessing all the way around. 
It's not our idea to give money. It's not our idea to give of our time. It's not our idea to give of whatever ability God has bestowed upon you in carpentry or plumbing or teaching or calling or encouraging, whatever the good deed might be, God prompts. We are responsible to be faithful. So there's all kinds of ways to be a blessing. There's all kinds of ways for you to utilize your talent. And God doesn't expect you to be like your neighbor and your neighbor to be like you. He's gifted you and he will prompt you to do these things. There's a company that uh, we are now engaged with that I believe gets this concept. And it's amazing the results that are happening because of God's faithfulness. Now, I'm a little bit partial to this company because I love coffee, all right? I just, I can't get enough coffee. I love, love, love coffee. If you want to meet with me, say, Casey, I'll buy a coffee at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. I will be there early, all right? Hey, but Hope Coffee is an organization that has helped folks who maybe don't have a good economy to learn how to grow coffee beans. And in doing so, now they can sell those coffee beans and, and, and make a profit for their village. And in doing so, in meeting the need, this missionary showed this village how to grow coffee. And now he's getting some revenue going through there. He's meeting their needs, their desperate, impoverished needs. And in doing so, he gained a voice with the entire village. He's a Christian, and he just shared with them the gospel. And both are spreading like wildfire. The gospel and their blessed economy is spreading like wildfire from one village to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And so now as a church, we are investing in Hope Coffee to help support the furtherance of all nations hearing about Jesus. Just simply by drinking Hope Coffee. We're going to switch in our own house to drinking Hope Coffee. That, they got all the blends and all that kind of stuff. They're doing a great job. And you will never miss the dollar more that it costs to buy Hope Coffee versus the cheap brands. You'll never miss it. But you'll have the opportunity to give and to be a blessing with this. And so um, our, our church here loves coffee as well. And we drink a lot of it. And now we're switching gears. And, and our cafe is going to have a purpose behind its existence. Not just to take and take and take and drink and drink and drink. But by buying Hope Coffee, we're now able to invest and be a part of God's great commission. To be part <laughs> of reaching people. It's just amazing. And so this is simple. I, I make a big deal out of this because God does a lot with our little, right? So just by sitting back there and drinking coffee and tithing and supporting the ministries of this church, you're going to be investing in people groups around the world, and God has a perfect register, and he rewards precisely. Isn't that cool? So you're going to go to heaven, you're going to learn of people that you've impacted around the world that you didn't ever know their name or how you even did that. And we do that also through the Southern Baptist Convention and our cooperative program. And it's amazing. We support 5,000 missionaries around the world. So I'm all about Jesus Christ and the Great Commission. And this is just one more way that we can continue to further the gospel. We've gotten started with this cross project and and we've even developed a mission team one, missions team one who's gone out and been a blessing to a, a local family in our neighborhood and impacted their life for Christ. We've got their ear right now. When we call, they listen and they look forward to a visit, okay? Now, I believe it's time to develop a missions team two to get another team on board. And maybe we can do these little missions projects in our community and abroad every couple months or so and just do what we can and allow God to bless it. Missions teams, too, we've already got one, two, three, four, about five or six people signed up for it. I'd love to have another five or six people uh, sign up for missions team, too. And now as I wrap up this message today, here's my encouragement to you. Start a new habit of serving people. Carve out time to start a new habit to do that. Begin a new way of blessing others. Discipline yourself to do these good things. God blesses those who do good deeds. 
I'm encouraging you also in that selflessness is opposed to servitude. It is a help. I'm sorry. Remember this, that pride will keep you guarding your time. Seriously, if you think too much of yourself, you would guard your time and your treasure and your talents. But if you are freely willing to give when there's a need, then you'll be liberal with that. And you'll just let that free flow. And by faith, you'll see in the end that your life will be more joyous and blessed. I like what uh, John Wesley said. He said, do all the good you can. By all the means you can. In all the ways that you can. In all the places that you can. And at all times that you can. To all the people that you can. As long as you ever can. I like what God said. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap what we sow if we do not grow weary. I like Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I forgot about that verse when I was preparing this sermon. That was one of those yikes verses for me. We've been created by God for good works. Ephesians 2.10 is worth marking in your Bible. Stand to your feet if you would please. And the invitation today is for those who would join missions team two. Come down and let me know. The invitation today is for those who have never been saved. If you would like to be saved, come forward and let's talk about that. If you'd like to join the church, come forward and let's talk about it. The invitation as well is for this cross project. And I want you to come and put a ribbon on here if you've shared Christ with the individual on this cross that your name is. If God's placed another name on your heart, I want you to come forward. The, this, this entire invitation is completely open to come and go as you please. Nail another name to the cross. If you have anything on your heart, come on down. <laughs>